there are two professional. Oh, got it. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, the um, 2021 R2 Professional Development Day. Um, and it's, um, you know, what it's really about mostly is to just take a pause um, for the day. Uh, you had last night off, you have today, um, and you have tonight. I think everybody is expected to be back tomorrow morning if you're working uh, tomorrow. So, um, so it's really just a, a, a time to take a break and pause and to um, you know, kind of think a little bit as we're now getting into um, you know, really the, I mean, goodness, uh, you know, we're really getting um, deeper into the R2 year and next summer, you know, um, and potentially even sooner, um, you're gonna have to start thinking about next steps, believe it or not. And for those of you, um, I don't know if you remember this from orientation, but one of the things I sort of really tried to um, inspire you to think about is not so much the what do I want to be, but rather the who do I want to be? Who is a healer do I want to be? What kind of a physician, not what type, but what kind of a physician I want to be? Um, uh, and this quote actually comes from Akira Kurosawa's movie back in the 50s. Um, but I just think it's, it's a really important thing to think about as you start residency training. However, um, that said, and that I still believe firmly sort of in that global philosophy, today really is going to be focused a little more on what do I want to be and what do I want my next steps to be? Because we do have to think about that too um, uh, along the way. So to do that, here's uh, the agenda for today. Um, and in uh, a few minutes, um, Nikki and Alex and Nikki, do you have slides? You, you had talked about that in your, uh, in an email. But... Alex is gonna be doing the talking. Oh, Alex is gonna be doing the talking. Okay, all right. <laughs> I'm holding you both responsible. The better half is, is going to in the interns. <laughs> oh, okay, I got you at the, at the intern event. But um, we're gonna talk a little bit more about potentially how to re-engage in ramp and how to use ramp a little bit more as an R2 uh, than as an R1. Um, and then uh, at 9.30, um, uh, with Andrea's help, we're gonna break out into three groups by career path, um, primary care, hospital medicine, subspecialty. Um, and, um, and I'll describe what we'll talk about in those breakout groups uh, a little bit later. We'll take our first break at 10.15, about an hour, a little over an hour from now. We'll come back at 10.30, um, and from 10.30 to 11, we'll sort of share the conversations that happened in those breakout groups. I'll talk a little bit about applying for chief residency, um, uh, because hopefully some of you are thinking of doing that. So we'll talk about that process, um, take another break, and then um, at the request of last year's residents, I usually didn't start talking about crafting your curriculum vitae until the spring professional development day. But, um, but feedback from last year was, hey, could you back that up a little bit? So we'll talk just for 30 minutes about um, uh, building your CV um, a little bit. And then I want to have a 30 to 45 minute just open class discussion. I have some some things you know to ask you and and for us to talk about and we'll wrap up lunch is late today um so uh, rather than sort of taking a lunch break and finishing later in the afternoon just decided to power through but if you get hungry and and you want to eat you know during a break or um during the class discussion that's totally fine uh with me as well um and then you'll have the afternoon with the intention is, um, you know, to to you know think about some of these things that we've talked about today. Think about next steps. Maybe you've had time this afternoon to set up, you know, some a, a meeting or two with potential mentors or research mentors or program mentors. Um, 
or maybe not, um, but, it, you know, um, and obviously there's time for you guys to get together and do some outdoor things uh, this afternoon. Lisa Vandevasi um, has, and two other uh, physician scientists faculty um, are then gonna run a panel discussion, an optional panel discussion at 4 p.m. this afternoon to talk about funding. If you're interested in sort of a physician scientist career, how do you think about funding those at different stages of the of your career? Um, uh, and so they uh, are going to do a, a one hour panel discussion. The, the URL is exactly the same as the URL for this morning. Um, and so please um, just sign back in if you want to participate in that uh, in that panel discussion. That was it was small last year, but it got rave reviews. And so um, being very helpful for people who are thinking about those types of careers. So, um, so uh, consider that. So, okay, a couple of quick announcements because I know that um, I, these are things I talked about at the last general house staff meeting, but I know many of you weren't able to make that house staff meeting. So I, I always just want to share sort of upcoming meetings um, that you guys can uh, participate in. The Washington chapter of the American College of Physicians meeting, um, uh, November 4th through the 6th, it's virtual. Residents are free to register. There's the URL uh, if you're interested in, uh, um, in doing, in going, going to that conference. Um, really fun meeting. Um, and, um, oh, and we'll have our Jeopardy team. Oh, I have to finalize that. I got, thank you for those of you who sent in nominations for the Jeopardy team. I need to finalize that. And then um, in January, they finally set the dates, January 21st, 22nd, the Northwest chapter of the Society for General Internal Medicine. Um, so ACP is a little bit more clinical and CME oriented. Um, SGIM is a little bit more academic and health services research oriented, um, but there, there's the call for submissions is now open. Um, so if you want to submit case reports, vignettes, QI projects, you know, uh, early aspects of any sort of research project, um, uh, um, there's the link uh, for that. So uh, always thinking about those. These are meetings that pre-COVID, um, you know, large numbers of residents would actually, we would go to and, you know, we would be there for the day. Um, but uh, last year, they, they moved to virtual, obviously, and they're doing them again this year, virtually. Just a quick update on a couple of searches going on in the program. Um, most of you hopefully know we're currently searching for a new associate program director for primary care. That's a 0.4, 40% time. Uh, FTE, it's a national search. Um, and Joyce Whip is the chair of that search committee. And that search committee is currently undergoing their, um, uh, you know, the, some of their training um, and uh, bias reduction training in, in the search. And um, Joyce sent out uh, a survey that many of you may have participated in. So thank you for that. And that should get started this coming month. Um, and then we're currently also searching for an assistant program director for wellness, 20% FTE. Those interviews have actually already started. Um, we got a bunch of really great applicants. Um, those interviews have started um, and hopefully uh, we'll have someone, I mean, it's always hard to predict these things, but um, I really hope that we'll have someone starting in that role mid-year this year. Uh, whereas the new primary care APD will most likely be for the next academic year. And then we're currently also searching for a pathway director for global health, um, a 10% FTE. Um, and we've already received applications for that and interviews uh, should be starting this coming month uh, and the following month. So uh, all those things are in process. I just wanted to sort of keep you up to date. Recruitment's also starting. So Eris just opened two days ago. <laughs> uh, and yesterday I spent my first day um, reading applications. So uh, all, the, all of us in the program leadership will be um, 
reviewing uh, you know, applications for the next couple of weeks. So it's a really busy time for us. We wanna get our invitations out um, by October 20th. Um, I think that's the right date. And, um, and yeah, okay. And then, um, and, uh, then interviews will be starting in early November. Um, all, all the interviews are virtual again. I'm sure you know that. We're doing a fewer number of days this year um, uh, based on feedback and advice from Andrea and Kelly. We're gonna do 16 interview days instead of the 21 or 23 we did last year, but we'll do a larger number of people per day. So we're still gonna be interviewing um, close to the same number of people and they're gonna be shorter. We've gotten a lot of um, feedback that these three quarter days, these full days um, are just really hard uh, for interviews. They will be the asynchronous events um, going on as well as the synchronous events. Um, and we're still working out, um, and I know Kelly's been working with the Chiefs and the RDC and Andrea as well to figure out how to organize um, sort of applicant dinners, you know, applicant uh, meet and greets. Um, they'll be virtual. And Kelly, I don't know if I know you've been looking into some new platforms. I don't know if you want to make any comments about that or, uh, but there'll be more information on that coming. Um, so, uh, Great. Uh oh, I see chats popping up. Yes, totally. Energy. <laughs> you know, uh, I would not. We've been trying to predict this. I actually do think that the virtual interview thing is here to stay. Um, and whether or not there are some hybrid options offered in some way, shape or form in the future. But I even, I think the, adva the financial advantages, the time, the travel, all, you know, the cost to you guys traveling around the country um, and, um, and the fact that people are sort of figuring out how to do it virtually. Um, yeah, I, I think Mac, there's a lot of general sentiment. We just had our national program directors meeting and I do think that there are pros and cons, but I think it's a net positive. And there are some things lost like being able to see the city and, uh, and the place, um, but there in the future, there may be other ways to do that. So, well, all right, cool. Yes, and oh my gosh, I don't even know how you guys afforded to do that. Uh, <laughs> I wanted to mention two very immediately late breaking um, changes that I have just gotten um, confirmation on uh, um, and uh, to the Harborview wards. In addition to all the other changes we're making this year, um, we're going to be able to tighten up the bounce back policy uh, for Harborview wards. It used to be a 14 day window and that residents didn't have to be present. The resident who knew the patient did not have to be present when the bounce back happened. Like if it was a senior, an intern alone day and it was the senior that knew the patient, um, the interns would still have to admit that person by themselves. Um, so uh, the resident who knows the patient must be present and it'll be seven days for new admissions instead of uh, the 14 um, for readmissions instead of 14. And then, um, and then there's consensus that there's an aftercare clinic built into the rest days on Harborview Day Medicine. Um, and, um, uh, and that just wasn't providing enough rest for the seniors who are doing day medicine because um, that's become a very busy rotation. And so we're gonna take that, that clinic uh, slot away. So I haven't even sent out, you know, announcements to the program yet. You're sort of the first to hear about uh, these. Um, uh, I literally got the email confirming the first bullet uh, <laughs> last night. So, all right, cool. Um, so uh, thank you, Roxanne. I appreciate that. So with that, um, let me um, turn things over uh, use Alex, um, are you ready to go? Any questions about any of that first before I turn things over to Alex? That's correct. That's correct, Marina.
they would they would they would if it's after that they go to the next team and then they may come back to you the following day that you're able to accept them uh but not not on call days after midnight was that happening cool okay all right, Alex, it's all you. All righty. Um, let me see if I can share my screen. Can you guys see that? Pumpkins. <laughs> see what we got here. Cool. Um, well, great. As you all know me, my name is Alex Torres. Um, I, as well as Nikki, are your R2 representation um, for RAMP, uh, the Residency Advisory uh, for Mentoring. Um, essentially, just wanted to take a few minutes um, today to just outline what we're doing um, now that we're R2s and kind of what changes we're making to the structure of RAMP to, uh, this year and really just make a pitch for uh, the importance of mentorship in your overall trajectory, regardless of if you're fellowship bound or not. Um, and I am a big fan of quotes. Um, personally, I find them inspirational. Um, so here's one from Isaac Newton. If I have seen it further, it is by standing on the, uh, on the shoulders of giants. Um, I think it's really important to recognize that we can make big changes, um, but it takes, it, it takes recognizing the, the people that, that helped educate us where we are now. Um, so a little bit about the structure. Um, you were all matched uh, as interns uh, with a ramp advisor. If you, based on your survey answers, um, if you didn't really know where you were uh, bound, uh, we matched you with your ACP advisors. Um, just as a heads up, there is a plan to then do a R2 rematch um, this fall. Um, and obviously you can reach out to us if you're, goals change you know in an interval that doesn't quite fit when we do the matching so you say all right well my goals haven't changed now but in a few months from now um you decide that well i don't want to do a pump print anymore i want to do hemonk and you know we can help you make that change and try and identify um a a mentor in that space so it's not even though we're doing the matching now this is not a kind of a binary thing um, we are here to help you all year. Um, and yeah, continue here. Uh, I think it's kind of as I was alluding to in the beginning, I think it's important to think about why mentoring is important. Um, I think it's really easy, if, especially if, you know, for those of us that are fellowship bound, um, to recognize the advantages there, um, but also, you know, if you're trying to go into hospital medicine, primary care, if you're trying to get more involved in a more research predominant career, or you're more systems or med ed or just uh, admin focused, um, essentially mentoring or how I like to think about it is just investing in relationships, making friends, um, connections is important no matter what you do. Um, it helps kind of outline the path uh, for which we are set on. Um, if you want to be a hospitalist, well, wouldn't it be great to know more about what that all looks like and, and how to set yourself up so you can get the job that you're looking for or learn more about like what jobs at an academic center look like or at a community or um, all of that, or even to be able to try and get those jobs. Um, the further we get out, from medical school and residency and later into our careers, um, the more and more I have found, um, and I'm sure you guys realize the same thing, is life is about relationships. Um, and it can be quite meaningful to get that sense of direction of 
where to go as well as to be able to get that extra kind of leg up um, to be able to make things happen for yourself. Um, one big change that we're making this year is that we're teaming up with the Residency Diversity Committee. Um, I think this is a really valuable change that we're making um, because I think, you know, from feedback from you all last year and that we were thinking about that we could uh, make this year is recognizing that there are a lot of different areas in which we can use mentorship. Um, and as we continue to prioritize, you know, uh, recruiting a more diverse um, residency class, we all come from different backgrounds and have um, different self-truths, different, you know, cultural experiences and identities that require different forms of mentorship. You know, if you, um, like, for example, me, if coming from a small island in the Caribbean, um, you know, wouldn't it be nice to be able to see someone that uh, is also from a similar situation, doing the things that you want to do, can kind of talk to you on a like personal level of what the challenges ahead look like and, and how to navigate those waters and also just having an inclusive support system um, in terms of having someone that recognizes those challenges and having you know a quote unquote safe space or safe person to go and talk to about how to address those things or, or just as a someone to vent to. Um, I think it's really important to have mentors that, you know, um, look like us and, and come from places that we do. Um, and even if it's not the exact same setup, I'm just recognizing that, you know, we're trying to build, uh, build that out. Um, so we're working with the, with the RDC to help improve that. Um, so that's an ongoing uh, and will be continuing to be an ongoing change that we have. Um, would also uh, say Ramp Buddies, thank you. Shout out to those of you who volunteered um, to be and have a Ramp Buddy. Um, I think, you know, whether you had a great experience with your Ramp Buddy or maybe um, it wasn't because for whatever reason, I think it's important to, you know, try and be there and, and create the culture that we all want to be involved in. Um, you know, even if you reach out to um, your buddy and they don't respond, I think it's important to just remember and recognize that interns are busy. Um, we weren't, we were also busy, busy ourselves, but interns are particularly busy. It's a big kind of mental shift. Um, and we're starting to get into the part of the year where things kind of get progressively harder. You find more comfort, but it's still always a change. The clouds are out more, it's a little bit rainy. Um, it's easy to start getting, um, you know, start to feel the beginning stages of burnout. And so even if you don't connect with your buddy that first time, I would just make a pitch for like just intermittently checking in, um, trying to make sure that there's, there's nothing that we can do to um, better support um, our buddies and, and try and be mentors ourselves um, in any which way. Um, you know, I think, you know, I have this on the buddy slide, but also I think it's really true in terms of what Ken was talking about, you know, well, what do you want to do with yourself or um, who do you want to be when we grow up? I think, again, this is where mentorship becomes important. Um, you know, if you cannot see where you're going, ask someone who has been there before. Um, and so, yeah, I, I will kind of leave it with that. Um, Otherwise, I don't really have a whole lot more. Um, I will just also make a final pitch of RAMP is not the only way to get mentorship. Um, obviously, mentorship uh, exists outside of RAMP. You can reach out to folks directly. Um, we, depending on your specialty, we have had um, more or less success being able to connect people. Um, I will just say that if you ever have any difficulty with your uh, mentor um, or in terms of like they're not quite as responsive or it's not a great fit, please let us know. Um, if you know of mentors that you know that you identified outside of RAMP, um, 
uh, that you think that they would, you know, be interested in taking on other people, please also let us know. We're always looking um, to recruit more mentors for the upcoming classes. Um, and yeah, I say no matter how you get it, just get it. Does anyone have any questions on things regarding grant matching um, or some of the changes that we're looking at this year? Cool. Cool. Okay, Alex, thank you so much. Uh, appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, great. All right, cool. Um, thank you. Some of those ideas sound fantastic. Uh, just let me know if uh, I can help in any way. Um, so, um, cool. All right, um, let's move on then to the to the next, uh, I'm gonna share my screen now very quickly, very briefly. Um, and so we are going to um, uh, create, we're gonna have you break out into three groups. And um, I think um, Andrea will um, tell you about this in a second. But I, the three breakout groups are um, people who think they're interested in primary care medicine, people who think they're interested in hospital medicine and people who think they're interested in subspecialty medicine. Yeah, <clears throat> excuse me. Yes, I know there are a few other um, career you know, goals other than just these three, but for the sake of this morning, um, you try to align yourself with one of these three. If you think about that you might do go into a subspecialty, but after a one or two years, you know, uh, working as a hospitalist as a gap thing, go into the subspecialty medicine group. Same thing for primary care. If you think you wanna do primary care, but you'll work for a year or two as a hospitalist before settling into a primary care practice, stay with the primary care group. So don't think so much about gap years, but more about um, uh, longer term career uh, trajectories. And then what I want when you're in these groups, um, and, and um, actually I can stop sharing my screen. Uh, so, okay. When you're in these groups, um, we'll have, you know, uh, till about 10, let me just double check the time. I think we'll have till 10, 15 before the break. So we'll have a, you know, uh, 40 minutes or so um, in the small groups. What I want you to do first, you'll have to, um, two, you'll need two people in the group, one to be a scribe to take notes and the other, maybe it's the same person or another person to then present during the, um, the, sh the, the sharing part of this after the break. Um, and then, uh, um, <clears throat> and in the groups, what I want you to do is for whatever group you're assigned, I want you to think about the pros and cons of that career. What are the pros and cons of a primary care career? What are the pros and cons of a hospital medicine career? What are the pros and cons of a subspecialty career? And so, write those down either on a, in a Word document or Excel spreadsheet or a PowerPoint slide. And then take you know, 10 minutes, 10, 15 minutes or so to do that. And then, and then switch. So primary care group after you do that, then take a few minutes to talk about what you perceive are the pros and cons of a hospital medicine career and the pros and cons of a subspecialty career. Same thing, hospital medicine group, start with hospital medicine 
and then think about the pros and cons for primary care and for subspecialty and subspecialty the same. And so you'll basically create three pro-con lists, one focused on your area of interest and the other two focused on the other two areas of interest. And then, um, and have those conversations and, you know, um, and, and maybe some of them are even questions as opposed to statements, but, uh, and then take a break at 10, 15. Um, I don't, Andrea, I don't think there's a need for them to come back to the big group before the break. Okay, good. And then, um, and then we'll come back, we'll reconvene at 1030, um, just under an hour from now, including the 15 minute break. And then we'll have each group um, share uh, their specialty. But what I want you to do just before the break is whoever's the scribe for each group, um, email it to Andrea and to me, and I will compile a list during that 15 minute break. Does that make sense? Okay. Cool. Um, yeah, and I see people, right. Uh, I see people sort of putting in their, uh, their interests. So, um, all right. Megan, are you up for this post-vaccine? <laughs> I think so. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thanks for being here. Okay, Andrea. Issues. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. <laughs> that's always shocking. Um, pay, I think in general, we were thinking, I think a lot of subspecialists get um, more pay, but then there are some that Lauren brought up, I think uh, infectious disease, endocrinology, um, like nephrology, things that can get uh, paid less money. I think we liked um, having like, you know, understanding a direction for next step in management, feeling like the expert, there were different kinds of relationships you had with patients. Um, you had the opportunity for blend of all the different kinds of ways to practice. Um, uh, you could have more practice, like answering the difficult questions. Um, and so I think there were some things focused around what it meant to be a subspecialist, like what you're able to do, and then also defining what we can't do. And so a lot of things that kind of come up in specialty clinic, be like, you should probably talk with your PCP about that. Um, if you're a subspecialist who doesn't practice primary care, whereas like if you're like doing endo or nephrology or out in the region, um, you can definitely do that. So I think those were some of the main stuff. I won't go through all that list, but then the cons, I think this is a bit mixed, but not always being the primary team or like not having that big picture managing everything can definitely be a con, like letting go of like kind of the control for managing all the different things. Um, your pay because of training, um, more training will be delayed. Um, so there's just more time delayed gratification. Um, potential for moving for training, having to engage in the match again, which is awful. Although I don't think my application has changed at all. <laughs> um, you have to kind of go through your intern year again as a first year fellow, which I've heard, I think a lot of us have heard it can be really, really intense. Um, and then I think Arita brought up um, a great point of sometimes, you know, in, I think in some situations you're making a diagnosis. But then a lot of the times I think things can be filtered to you and you're just managing stuff as opposed to like really having like diagnostic ability. Um, <laughs> um, and then uh, inbox management uh, can also be pretty intense. And then I think we also spoke about like an existential crisis for not filling a need for primary care and other mm. really, um, really needed fields um, across here and everywhere. That's that's a great one. I love that one. Uh, so that yeah, that existential. We know what the healthcare system needs, um, but not that's not the kind of physician we want to be. Uh, yeah, totally. So, all right, good. Um, well, uh, so that's great. And then um, let me. Let's see, uh, just trying to think of the, so 
I didn't get, um, I got most, what, yeah, <laughs> I like this one. So let me, um, let me, let me just show a slide um, of what other people thought of subspecialty medicine. And I didn't, I, this is the one slide I didn't get everything typed into from the other two groups. Um, but, uh, but, you know, similar things. I like how, so this is from the primary care and hospital medicine group. I liked um, how one group put $4 signs, the other group put $5 signs. <laughs> but, um, and, you know, Mac, as you pointed out, um, it's very specialty dependent and it's primarily driven by procedures. Um, and so again, if, and procedures showed up on that pro list, if you like procedures, whether it's, you know, cardiology, GI, palm critical care, or even um, uh, there are some other specialties that have some other procedures, um, billing for dialysis, things of that sort. But a lot of the primary care, no, that's wrong. A lot of the ambulatory focused non-procedural specialties, and you called them out, rheumatology, endocrinology, um, uh, uh, ID, um, sometimes nephrology, depending on what they're focused on. The hospitalists make more money than they do. And, um, and they, they make, you know, not much more than, than a busy primary care doc probably would make. Um, so it, the money thing is really highly variable. A um, couple other things that I saw on this list, just to call out, you're an expert. There's something inherently satisfying about, you know, rather than being sort of a, in primary care, sort of a jack of all trades, now you're sort of a, an expert in one small area. Um, and the prestige that comes with specialty medicine, um, which whether we agree with it or not, and or, or the financial rewards, um, it's the way our system is kind of built. Um, and then I like can have the hospitalist or primary care doc order things. Uh, <laughs> so, and, and the things that you're focusing on seem less some of the, the daily grind. Um, the disadvantages are pigeonholing yourself into a subspecialty um, and maybe things, and, and I like this buyer's remorse. What if you get through fellowship training and you're like, uh, actually, I'm not sure I like it as much anymore. And, and of course, then um, many of the other things uh, that you guys talked about. So any thoughts from the group about those? Um, uh, it's interesting to see, you know, how the group that's interested in it sort of identifies some, but, but not all. Um, Well, let's let's have the let's do primary care next. Um, the primary care group. Um, you can share your pros and cons. Either paste them into the chat like that, or share your screen. Either either one. I can share my screen. Okay. Okay, can people see our uh, Word document? Yep, totally. I can, we have a lot of pros of primary care, not surprisingly, um, and a lot of them tie into kind of structural things like that we don't have to work in the hospital, we don't have overnights or weekends or nights, we uh, don't have to do any additional training, so we get that uh, attending salary right out of um, residency. It's a highly desired job so we can practice almost anywhere in the country with a regular schedule that's very predictable. And then there's also components to primary care that we really like, like building long-term relationships, focusing on preventative care, um, that there's a lot of diversity in what you're seeing, uh, that you are practicing kind of those more art of medicine skills like counseling, teaching, and motivational interviewing. 
um, and that there's a lot of flexibility to create your own niche and kind of have your own and, whether it's equity or advocacy or HIV medicine or women's health or a variety of other things. Uh, there are also some opportunities for short in-office procedures, if that's something you're interested in. The cons, you make less money, you have less prestige. All of us said that we had experienced people being like, wow, you want to do primary care? Is that going to test your brain? I could never do that. Kind of those kinds of primary care microaggressions um, that takes a lot of time to build a panel. And because of that, there's some less flexibility. You can't just kind of up and get a new job um, if you have spent a lot of time building your panel. And then other things like documentation, panel management, in-basket, um, and then the responsibility of being the person that the specialists and hospitalists send uh, their patients to you to figure out all the stuff that is kind of tricky or nuanced after they've stabilized them. So um, pros and cons for sure. Yeah, totally. And um, uh, similarly, um, the other two groups came up with uh, similar things. Let's see if this, uh, does that share? Um, Becca, you're at the top of my screen. Can you see that? Okay, thanks. Um, so this is what the subspecialists and the hospital medicine group said of primary care, very similar, no more training after residency, long-term relationships with patients, um, flexibility in, in the way your career goes, work wherever you want, can defer to the subspecialist, just like the subspecialist <laughs> defer some things to the primary care um, uh, physicians. More predictable hours, home visits, love home visits. Uh, not sure why subspecialists can't do home visits, by the way. Um, but in any event, um, patients don't sue PCPs usually. Um, that's fascinating. I actually don't know of any data about that. Do any of you? Um, I, I think, uh, I don't know. I wonder if that's, uh, you, you guys probably know more than I do. Um, the flexibility, the long-term relationships, uh, which has been called out a couple of times, holidays off, predictable schedule, widest scope. Um, absolutely. In, and um, can do in some inpatient if desired and then location. Um, yeah, and widest scope. I, you know, it's interesting, Nikki, that your group, the, the primary care microaggressions, um, it, I, I heard a talk once, uh, and this is another way to spin all this, um, but that sp subspecialists are actually narrow, narrowly focused physicians and, and generalists are you know, primary care docs and hospitalists sort of in the middle are much more broader scope um, physicians. And, um, and, and some people actually say being a primary care physician is actually the hardest and most intellectually challenging um, uh, subspecialty of medicine. Whereas like for me to learn pulmonary medicine, it's not that much. I have, I have to learn how to read PFTs, you know, and, <laughs> uh, um, and dose steroids. Cause we do that a lot. And, you know, like the, like the range of things, yes, you go deeper, but the range, it's not that hard being a subspecialist, quite honestly, in that. I sense. actually had a, a clinic attending say that she read a study that was like how many years until you felt quote comfortable in your job. And a hospitalist said it was like three years. And a, I don't remember what the subspecialist was, but the primary care doctor, it was like seven and a half years before you felt comfortable or confident with your job. Yeah. Yeah. That's but that's a pro really, and a con, right? Like that uncertainty it, it is, is really scary too. No, absolutely. Un the uncertainty um, and with dealing with undifferentiated patients. Absolutely. Um, totally. So anyway, the other cons you see on the list, the administrative burden, inbox um, in all caps, never truly off in a sense. Um, I guess that means you always have to be available for your patients because, um, uh, but um, emotional support, dealing with insurance, FMLA, um, uh, yeah, 
So I think I saw somewhere, yeah, the chronic opiate uh, patients. So, okay, so good. So that kind of fleshes that out. And then the hospital medicine group. I can share my screen because I have the Word document. Thanks, Jessica. Yeah. Uh, let's see, there we go. So a big theme for ours was flexibility in terms of schedule. Um, obviously the week on week off is a common one, but some people adapt that to fit their needs. And then flexibility in terms of geographic options, in terms of where you're practicing. Uh, there's a great need out there for hospitalists and the job market's pretty advantageous for the applicant. Um, you can still choose to specialize in certain things. Some people choose a niche of ultrasound or like specialize in thamboses, et cetera. You can also still do research or teach residents and bring med students. You can still work in admin and in groups that focus on patient safety, capacity management, et cetera. You can still have that fulfilling relationship with patients while they are inpatient. Um, but obviously you don't keep following them as an outpatient, which can actually be a con. Uh, you're off when you're off. That was a big one. Um, you don't have an inbox to manage. You aren't going to be paged or called when you're on your off day. That's a huge, um, at least for someone like me, where I need that separation. That's a big draw. Um, you can still pivot into different things. Um, a couple people in our group felt like if you later on decide you want to do a specialty or a subspecialty, you can still pivot into fellowship. You can still choose to have a primary care um, sort of direction if you want to transition to that later on, if you decide you don't like being a hospitalist anymore. And when patients get really ill, we punt to our ICU colleagues to take care of that. So that part's nice if you don't want to deal with the acutely, acutely ill. Um, and some people choose to be a hospital as well, also practicing a subspecialty. And in terms of cons, uh, some people don't like that uh, schedule of working really intense hours and then being off. A lot of hospitals have mentioned to me that they've burnt out on that. Handoffs can be tricky. You're signing out these patients and um, you're doing that quite frequently, um, both receiving and giving handoff. And then someone said dispo can be quote freaking annoying. Um, you deal with a lot of those sort of social elements, which can be hard. And yeah, if you really want to do like basic science research, that can be hard to manage on a hospital schedule. So not to mention going straight into attending ship right after residency, which has the benefit of um, that salary, but at the same time, it sounds like uh, it can be a pretty tough transition. Cool. Great. Um, and then, uh, so, um, and then just to share what some of the other groups came up with, I actually found this interesting. Um, it wound up being the longest lists from both of the other groups. <laughs> um, but, uh, and they called out similar things. Uh, to your to your group, um, you know, uh, with no more training, no inbox, which you know um, isn't entirely true. You get all these queries from the billing people and things like that. Job anywhere, compartmentalize. Um, much more freedom. I I'm not sure what was meant by that. I was wondering whether that meant just the the schedule um, is, I, I don't know if people want to chime in about what was meant there. Um, still do procedures, um, setting boundaries, autonomy, you kind of are responsible, you own the patients who are in the hospital while they're there. A little bit more medically exciting, more pathophysiology, more acutely ill patients, and yet a quick turnaround. Um, you, you you either cure them if they have you know something curable or you help stabilize them back to their chronic state uh, and you often do see more short-term results can, can say goodbye to patients you don't like um, uh, and then 
thankful patients and families and no fellowship attending salary. And then you can see the cons there, high degree of burnout, work hours, really challenging. Um, and, you know, I, I wonder if some of that's actually worse during COVID, like what you're seeing in residency. I wonder if, you know, the, the hospitalists are getting burned out um, and taking a huge brunt of the added burden of COVID and all across the country, not just here actually. And um, there's data about that. Uh, and, um, but even a little bit, the work hours were challenging. You know, the number of weekends that you have to do in a year is, is pretty high. Um, dispo issues, what else? Admitting for ortho and optho, that just, that's like Harborview, but that's not always, it depends where you are, I guess. The existential angst, I like that. Adrenaline, adrenaline wound up in the con, it wound up in both, didn't it? It was like uh, the high acuity, medically exciting, but the adrenaline also was in the con list if you don't want some of that. Um, interestingly, um, some of the models for, uh, for hospital medicine what you're seeing here is really just one model. Um, and um, so you just have to, you know, if you want to be a hospitalist, but you don't like the, you know, the week on week off and the high weekend um, burden, there are hospital medicine practices around the country uh, that graduates have told me about um, where they have a group practice basically and um, and and they work Monday through Friday. That's their just that's their Monday through Friday job. Is just like a primary care doc goes into the office. The hospitalists come into the hospital. And they take care of the hospitalized patients, and then they have weekends off. And then they so um, they wind up working about the same number of days in a year, maybe a few more, but they but the weekends are off and the way they handle the weekends is they cover for each other. Um, so instead of the seven on seven off, you're doing sort of Monday through Friday, Monday through Friday. And then you get, you actually get more continuity with patients in that model, but you're getting your weekends off just like someone in a regular job. Um, and so, uh, so think about that as you're thinking about hospital medicine jobs. Any other thoughts from you in the group? Uh, did things resonate, um, not resonate? Any additional questions? Um, there's no right and wrong here. These are all just what people from different perspectives have of the other thing. Um, and really what it comes down to is thinking about which of these sets of pros and cons aligns you know, resonates most with you, right? Because none of the job paths, you know, are, ha don't come, none of them uh, are free of disadvantages. It's just, as you weigh them, which are the ones that resonate more or less with you? Which are the ones you can live with? Um, which are the ones you can't live with? Um, so it, it's good putting them all out there. Thoughts? Reflections? Anything surprise anybody? What the follow up to this, by the way, is in the spring, and 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 what I'm going to do is I'm going to save these lists. The in this at the spring our two professional development day, we will actually have panels of people from each of these career trajectories. We'll also have a group for people interested in non-traditional paths. Um, but um, so we'll have a panel of hospitalists, we'll have a panel of primary care people, uh, subspecialists. And, and I'm gonna save and I'm gonna show them your pro con list. And then you, you'll have another six months, you know, of experience and thought about all this. And then you can interact with that panel in a way, and, and maybe we'll be live in the spring, although I don't dare promise anything. Um, but then you can interact with them and say, 
are these things true? How much differences really are there? What is it really like out there? And, uh, and as just a teaser, one of the, um, uh, the, the primary care group is always surprised to hear actually at what the base salaries actually are in primary care, uh, that they're not as low as uh, some people uh, think. And so, so anyway, that'll be the follow-up for this. Okay, well, thanks for doing that. I hope you enjoyed being in your small groups and chatting about that stuff. Um, before the next break, uh, which will be, uh, let's see, in about 15 minutes or so, 15, we are right on schedule, by the way. Um, and uh, I wanna talk to you a little bit about chief residency and, um, uh, as something for you to consider, I hope several of you, many of you are considering it, it regardless of your career trajectory, um, there are advantages to a chief year. Um, and um, as a gap, um, as, uh, you know, as a, uh, as a way, as a different sort of preparation to, for whatever your career might be. So uh, I'm going to, let's see if I'm gonna um, come back and I'm gonna share my slides and I'll talk to you a little bit about the process that we go through uh, for chief selection as well. Cause, um, whoops, oh my gosh. <laughs> I almost left the meeting for everybody. <laughs> that would have been a mistake. Okay, I'm just rambling now. Okay, considering chief residency. Um, and, uh, you know, um, I did a year as a chief resident. Um, and to me, all the advantages, you know, I saw all the advantages and at that time in my life, very few disadvantages. It was actually one of the most formative and one of the most educational years of my entire training, even more than fellowship. I learned so much during my chief residency about how hospitals run, about how programs run, about how, um, and, um, and then just the medical knowledge, you know, of, const of just constant teaching every single day, run a morning report or, in our program, other conferences and, and, and the preparation that goes into that. And, you know, and, and um, I think I was the smartest that I ever was at the end of my chief residency year. It does, it is a year that comes uh, with some costs though too. Uh, it's, it's not <laughs> risk-free, shall we say. Um, so what is a chief resident? A chief resident, um, does a lot of things. They are a leader. Um, they are a role model, a mentor. We talked about mentorship. They're a coach um, for residents and students. They're obviously an educator, a teacher, an administrator. That's part of the job that some people wind up not liking is the administrative part. Um, but again, you learn a lot doing that. They are a tremendous source of support for you guys um, uh, and they interact with you even more you know than um, the APDs and, and me so they are a tremendous support for you and they advocate for you like crazy the two changes that I just announced earlier today about that Harborview um, you know those came from Linda and Hannah coming to me and saying hey you know um, and can we advocate for this change? And, and I'm like, absolutely. And, and so, um, so then we started that process with the medical service and, um, and change happened. So uh, advocacy for the residents is a big part of the job. Um, so again, that's much of what they do. They're, they're this, this person, you know, for residents in a complex and rapidly changing academic healthcare system. 
Um, they're also um, stewards of, of teamwork and of program culture. So much of the program culture kind of, you know, um, is reflected and, and by them and um, outwardly. There's time to do scholarship um, during chief residency. Um, depending on which positions, the, some of the positions come with uh, scholarship time, others don't. Um, you learn, you build your clinical practice. So again, some of the jobs come with clinical time and some don't, um, so you have to look at them. And, you know, and um, the chiefs are just an absolutely essential part of our program, respecting all of our, reflecting all of our core values. Um, and, and those are some of the things you know, that we look for. Um, so again, qualities, these are a list, you can read these, these are, um, but these are the things that we look for, uh, um, you know, in people who apply for uh, chief residency. Chiefs need to be respected by their peers um, and by the faculty. They have to represent and advocate for residents, mentor and support them often with a lot of sensitivity and discretion. A lot of stuff is shared with chiefs um, that never gets to me. Um, and, uh, and that's important uh, for how that happens. Um, uh, collaboration, they, they have to be strong collaborators. They have to be committed to the residency program and really want to not just enrich it, but to work to improve it. Again, the two examples from this morning. Um, Good managers, good organizers. Um, they have to. They do have to manage competing priorities. Um, uh, they do have one foot in the faculty camp and one foot in the residency camp, and and they have to balance that. And uh, you can see some of the other bring I innovative ideas and suggestions for change, um, etc. So, uh, so those are some of the qualities that we look for. We have a lot of jobs. When I tell other program directors around the country how many chiefs they ha we have, they're like, "What?" <laughs> um, and uh, and we do. We have a lot. The inpatient focused chief jobs at Harborview. We have sort of the one inpatient chief job um, at at the U. Two inpatient chief jobs because scholarship time is built in. Uh, to the UW job, six months on, six months of scholarship um, time. Uh, and two people at the VA who can split the year uh, differently. Sometimes they split it um, in half and have scholarship time the other half. Other times, as you've seen this year and last year, they split it up into smaller chunks and do more co-teaching and co-leadership. Chief residents for quality and safety. There's one at Harborview, one at the VA. And then we have a lot of outpatient ambulatory chiefs, uh, one at Harborview, one at Roosevelt, two at the VA that are referred to as clinician teacher fellows. They really, whoops, sorry. They really function primarily uh, as uh, ambulatory chief residents. And the, the new, relatively new one, it's in its third year now uh, at Belltown. And then the global health chief resident, um, and I haven't announced it yet to the whole program. So again, you're the, I think you're the first to officially hear, it may have bubbled up through the grapevine, but Catherine Fair is gonna be the Naivasha chief for next year. Um, I'm so excited about that. She is just so excited. So Lauren uh, Onafre is on her way there or is leaving in another week or two. Um, and so as we get our Naivasha site back up and running uh, after a COVID hiatus, and then um, Catherine will be the uh, Naivasha chief next year. So, um, let me, I just want to open my chat box. Yes, exactly. So uh, yes, actually, so Mac, um, uh, um, has there ever been talk of giving Harborview two inpatient chiefs? Yes. And actually, um, a few, the, the quality chief at Harborview is only also only three, four, three, four years old. And, um, and it got started because we needed a second inpatient chief at Harborview. And the way to get it funded was to call it a QI chief. Um, 
And so uh, they don't split the year the way the two UW chiefs do or the VA chiefs. But if you watch how Hannah and Linda are working this year, that's how it's designed to be with the QI chief really being um, sort of a, an affiliate inpatient chief and running you know, one morning report a week and doing some of the new conferences and sharing the load. Because a few years ago, before we had even the Q, QI chief at Harborview, that was a burnout job uh, You know, by three quarters through the year. They had a great time being the only person for Harborview and then three quarters of the way through the year, they were uh, pretty fried. So, um, so we, that's how we, we had to, that's how we had to build it, Mac, if you're kind of behind the curtain, um, uh, because that's how Harborview was willing to fund it. Yeah, we, we want a QI chief, but not another inpatient chief. <laughs> I'm sneaky that way sometimes. Okay, uh, so those are the jobs that are available. And then um, uh, this is where you can learn more about the job description. Oh, I just realized I took this from our old website. Oh, I have to take it from, the, but if you go to the intranet on the new website, you'll still see under professional development, you'll still see um, uh, a link to the chief resident job descriptions. And then you can scroll down and read about each individual one uh, so that you can compare and contrast the different, because some might appeal to you and others might not appeal to you. And, and when you apply to be a chief, you apply to specific positions, not just to be a chief and then get assigned to one of them kind of a thing. So let's talk about the application process. Um, we do, um, it is an application process in our program. In other programs, people are sort of tapped on the shoulder um, by the program director or the chair of medicine and said, hey, we'd like you to be chief next year. Do, you know, are you willing to do that? Um, or it's a, a solely a faculty nomination process, um, uh, sometimes by the general faculty, sometimes by the residency leadership. We have you guys, if you're interested, you apply. You'll get emails about this. The process usually runs, December might be a little early, really sort of January through March of this year for you. Um, and um, you identify yourself as candidates um, by email with a very brief cover letter and your CV. Um, and all of the contact information is on our website. Um, and you can apply for as many positions as you're interested in. If you wanna be an inpatient chief, and at, at any of the three hospitals, you can apply for all those inpatient chiefs uh, in positions. Um, uh, and some people apply for both inpatient and QI and, and some people apply for all of them because they, <laughs> so um, you don't need a letter of recommendation um, to apply for the chief job. I get that question a lot. Carrie Farquhar has wanted a, a letter of recommendation for the Naivasha chief position. That may go away uh, this year, but that has been true in the past. And so then you apply and then you will be interviewed by different senior leadership at each site. Um, so, for example, at the VA, you usually interview with Rudy Rodriguez, Paul Cornia, um, Joy Swift, Tyler Albert. Um, I'm forgetting who else is on that, uh, the people you interview with. And, um, and, uh, and so they, they will interview uh, you. Those service chiefs can also request to see your teaching evaluations um, and um, as part of this process, um, not your competency evaluations, but your teaching evaluations. I want you all to know that I don't choose. There is no way I could pick amongst you. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, um, it just, yeah. So the, the selection resides with the service chief um, or clinic chief because they will be the other person that you work with, right? So the inpatient chiefs here at the U work very closely with Brad Anawal and equally closely with um, me and with Kelly. And so 
the service chiefs um, do choose uh, and offer positions. Um, the program only provides modest input, um, and uh, you know, and and so I don't even know, you know, I have no way of knowing if you even applied for the job. Um, and then we will have an opportunity for you all, and you may remember this from last year, we will send out an anonymous survey so that you can provide input on your peers. And we share that. And then there's a single day in April. It's sort of weird. It is a little bit like match day, except it happens. Uh, it's a uniform job offer day. Um, and so then uh, you will get a phone call that morning. You may get multiple phone calls uh, from the VA, from the clinic, from this site, and then you get to choose. You have the power to choose if you get multiple offers, uh, which one uh, you want to take. And then I only make the list public once there's been communication and acceptance uh, across the board. We actually do it this way to be the fairest to you. Um, we actually talked about this at MRAC several years ago about changing the process. And I called around, I must have called 14 or 15 different programs and found 12 different ways that chief residents um, are, are uh, chosen, are selected. And the, res and the residents here really felt that being able to apply and advocate for yourself during an interview process really um, you know, took away a, a little bit of the, the mystery and a little bit you know, for some people who are quieter and might not be as well known um they could really sort of uh speak up and advocate for yourself um and so we've kept doing it that way last year we started to change our process and we're going to do more this year to really promote equity to minimize bias in the process and to enhance diversity amongst our chief resident group um, Again, it's an application process, not an identification process. That is something we've done for a long time, but that actually does, that is a, as I've um, done some reading about this and talked to other places again, that does help promote equity by allowing everybody to apply. And we will interview all applicants. We always have, and we will continue to do that. What we're gonna be doing more of is developing structured interviews with standardized questions um, and develop a standardized evaluation rubric based on experiences, attributes, metrics, and answers to the standardized questions. Um, and those are things that we haven't done as much in the past. We started to do it a little bit last year, um, but I really wanna uh, get the sites to do that more this year. Um, and then the selection committee members at each site, we're going to ask them to do implicit bias training um, as well. Uh, and we'll get continue to get your input through an online survey, um, uh, uh, you know, to, to help with this process. Um, so I really, I went to a workshop recently on how to do this, enhance diversity and minimize bias in the chief resident selection process. And I was pleased to see that we were already doing uh, most of what is considered um, best practice with the exception of the standardized questions and evaluation rubrics. Um, uh, and so we're gonna build those into the process this year. And I wanted to share that with you. Okay, so uh, so that's sort of wanting to be a chief resident um, and how that process will unfold, um, you know, over the winter months. And there'll be emails about all this as well. I want to actually say something very specific to the three new people in your class. Um, and you are also absolutely, um, uh, able to apply for a chief resident position, even though you didn't do your R1 year here. And I want to reassure you that we have actually had chief residents in the past, not for the last few years, but in the past, who did their R1 year elsewhere, came here as R2s, and really wanted to become a chief and applied and got the job. So, um, so please, you know, um, yeah, uh, everybody. 
uh, think about that. Questions, answer, or I don't know about answers, but questions. <laughs> um, so you're welcome. Uh, oh, Erica, what do you what do you mean? Are there restrictions on the kind of research you can do? You mean during your chief resident year? Yeah, yeah. Like if we're if it's supposed to be within the confines of medical education or QI, or can you do subspecialty research? Other things that you've been doing before? That's a fabulous question. It, it absolutely there's no restriction. You and in fact people who are subspecialty bound and who may have been working on a project during residency now have another six months to go back to the lab or work with that person on their day, you know, if it's a database project. So you absolutely can still do subspecialty oriented, basic science, translational science, it does not have to be med ed. Uh, um, so the QI chiefs usually work on a QI project. Uh, and during do you have to have those, like what your research would be kind of no. and ready at the time of application? Nope. I mean, you, you'll, you may get that question. For example, if you interview here at the U, Brad might ask, so, you know, what will you do with your scholarly time? So you may want to have some thoughts about that, but there doesn't have to be a commitment yet from a mentor uh, with, in that regard. Does that help, Erica? Is that what you were asking? Yep. Okay, great. Okay, let's take another break. We're about five minutes behind, but that's all. Uh, I thought we would finish this around 11.15. It's 11.20. So let's take a, um, a 10 minute break and be back at 11.30. We'll talk uh, for a little bit about uh, building a, your CV um, to get prepared for all this stuff. And, uh, and then we'll, um, uh, I've got some topics for class discussion. Um, so see you back at 11.30. All right. Okay. Well, welcome back, everybody. There's a few more puffy clouds outside right now, but it still looks quite nice. <laughs> It's nice in your neighborhood too. All right, well, uh, why don't I go ahead and get started? Um, and then, um, so this should, you know, I'm just gonna buzz through some slides um, and, uh, and then, um, We'll have an open class discussion and um, uh, so, and then we'll wrap up for the day. So, cool. Okay, sharing screen again. Here it comes more PowerPoint. Gotta love it. <laughs> okay, uh, so. Um, so again, this was a request uh, of the of last year's class um, was to move this up a little bit in the year. Um, 
so that you can start working on it. And, um, and, you know, there's the thing about a curriculum vitae, quite honestly, is that it's a work, it's a, it's a, a work in progress. And if you, um, depending on what type of job you have and, and go, what you go into after residency, um, your CV may remain quite dynamic for many years. My CV is just an open document that always has stuff getting added to it. Um, and uh, other people just use their CV for their first job and, um, uh, and never use it again. But uh, so highly variable, but um, building your CV um, and, and the reason is if you're gonna ask that it's just reality <laughs> that if you're going to ask, you know, hey, is this a job I can apply for? Hey, we can we write me a letter for my fellowship application? You know, um, I'm getting a lot of this now from R3s uh, and, you know, hey, I'm applying for a job down in Portland. Will you be a reference for me? Um, the response will always be absolutely. Can you send me your CV? <laughs> Uh, and, and that this is just not for me. This is for anybody, uh, any mentor that you ask, um, or any job you apply for, they're going to want to see this. Um, and if there's a one single thing that I want you to take home from today, um, it's that a CV is not a resume. It's not, they're, they're related. They, they sort of, you know, have to do with jobs and job applications. Um, but a CV is designed very differently than a resume, where a resume is very concise, one to two pages. It just focuses on the highlights and it's tailored for a particular job. Um, it's not, um, uh, you know, uh, people have different resumes for depending on what types of jobs they want to apply for. And it's really sort of designed to be a little bit flashy, to create interest in you. Um, and, uh, and that's kind of a resume. A CV is duller, it's longer. Uh, now, a CV may still be one to two pages for you at this stage in your career, but you know, mine's like 30 pages long. Um, and so a CV is longer, it's much more comprehensive. Um, it's similar regardless of the job you're looking for. And it's really designed more as a way to document your training and your work, your education training and your work, rather than designed specifically to create interest in you. Um, and, uh, and so um, that's one thing uh, to keep in mind. There is a standard curriculum vitae format for UW faculty. If you're gonna um, apply for a, a, an attending, um, you don't have to worry about following the exact format if you're just applying. But, but if you do get a job in our system, you will have to put your CV into standard UW faculty format. It's the same format upper campus, uh, health sciences campuses. Um, it starts with personal data, it then documents your education, then your postgraduate training, any faculty positions held, any hospital positions held, honors or awards you've received, board certification that you might have or be eligible for, your current licenses, in this case, medical licenses, your professional organizations, any teaching responsibilities, editorial responsibilities, national responsibilities, local responsibilities. There are sections called out for each of these in our faculty CVs. Any research funding that you've had in the past or currently have, or that have that you've applied for. Um, and then your bibliography, and then afterwards major presentations, and then sort of another section. And the truth is, is that a lot of this isn't relevant at your stage. You haven't held a faculty position yet. You haven't had a hospital position yet. You're not board certified, although you will be able to say that you're board eligible as of uh, completing residency. Um, and you know, unless unless you've actually done some of these things. Many of you won't have, you know, teaching editorial, national or 
you know, responsibilities or research funding. Some of you, of course, do, ha do have these. And, and again, some of you, um, depending on your background and if you've done a lot of research before in your career, you may, you may already have um, a CV that's, that's more extensive. But for most residents, um, it's fairly short. So these are sort of the things I would think about putting into your CV, the personal data education, postgraduate training, honors and awards, board eligibility, current license, professional organizations like SGIM or ACP, teaching responsibilities. If, you, um, uh, you know, if you've done a couple of preclinic conferences, if you've done an academic half day, um, you can put those in there. Um, any committees that you're on, if you've been on MRAC or if you're on a school of medicine committee or an outside committee or a hospital committee, um, research projects that you've been involved with, your bibliography, a works in progress section is absolutely fine for, um, for your CV at this stage. Presentations you've done, like if you go to SGIM this winter and present an abstract, you know, or present a case report, you can put it there. And I think language skills, while that's not a required part of the UW uh, CV, but if you uh, speak other languages and you're applying for your first um, primary care or um, hospital job um, or fellowship, um, those things are good to highlight at this stage. Uh, of the game so oh and yeah sorry you should include all of these categories but then if you don't have anything in there you just put not applicable or none but then it's there as a placeholder and so then as you do things in the future you then fill in those sections under that heading i'm not following the chat it looks like there's a are these Sorry, we're we're talking about like you know in areas yeah. where you put your hobby section. We're just talking about putting our cats, yeah, things in our CV. Of course you are. <laughs> <laughs> Got to have your cats in there. So I wonder if that goes under personal data or under yeah. In my defense, I didn't even bring up cats. That was everybody else. I brought up quote unquote hiking because that's what everyone puts. Yeah. Don't put it on your CV. <laughs> There's no personal interest section, uh, uh, interests section, unfortunately. Um, but in any event, um, we'll talk about cover letters in the spring and you can put stuff like that in job cover letters. So personal data, what goes into these sections? Um, uh, place of birth, citizenship, contact information is optional, but um, most people do include an email address uh, or a cell phone number. Don't put your social security numbers or your date of birth on your CV. Common mistake. Um, you don't want to do that. Um, and then um, the education, and it goes in order uh, from oldest to newest, undergraduate, graduate degrees, um, school of medicine. And then you can list the field of, uh, field of study. Um, it, for your degree, if if you wish, like um, Bachelor of Arts in Anthropology, but the anthropology part uh, is not necessary. Um, the date that uh, that you got the degree, the institution, um, and the degree itself. Postgraduate training, internship, residencies, fellowships, oldest to newest, um, very common kinds of uh, uh, things. Honors. Um, a lot of people go. I don't have a lot, of, you know, but. If you go back there, you may have, you know, AOA, Phi Beta Kappa, you know, Humanism Awards, various medical school departmental prizes, Young Investigator Awards, or, you know, et cetera. Um, and so uh, really try to think about things um, to put in there. Um, the board certification, current licenses, um, and including the states. Um, uh, uh, which would obviously be Washington State here. You have a training license, or maybe some of you have a permanent license now. Again, professional organizations. Um, some of you, um, you know, 
belong to other groups uh, that are important. Um, and please feel free to list all those things. And then, um, and then list MRAC, list, you know, uh, RDC, list, you know, these are things that uh, are local responsibilities um, that are actually, that are absolutely important um, to list if you're, if you're doing them. So, cool. Research funding bibliography major presentations. Uh, we talked about that. So again, key points. Keep it concise for now. Um, you know, most of you are going to have a page. Some of you may have up to four pages. Um, you know, if uh, if you have an advanced degree or you've spent time doing a lot of research, it's usually the bibliography after the core section. It's usually the bibliography that then. Uh, creates most of the uh, space. So um, omit your previous work experiences not directly related to your professional career. So this is where it differs from a resume, but you know, um, and may maybe this is where, you know, I don't know if cats fall under that section. Uh, um, but, um, uh, and then you can, even though it's, the resume is very flexible and the CV is less flexible. You can change the emphasis in your CV based on your goals. So if you're interested in research position or fellowship, you wanna list as much research work as you possibly can. But of course, if you're focused more on a medical education or a teaching position or a teaching track in a fellowship, really try to think about all those teaching opportunities um, uh, to be able to add to your CV. Um, so uh, just a few things. And then, yep. Sorry, you were just getting to it. Uh, Natalia asked, what does the bibliography section include normally? So yeah, exactly. So this is the order for your bibliography. Obviously, uh, you may or may not have things in these different categories. But the, at the top of the list is publications in refereed journals. Um, uh, so that's first, and then book chapters, and then published books, videos, published software, not sortware, um, uh, and then section D are other publications, things that you've published in non-refereed journals, online, um, uh, you know, online journals, online blogs, editorials, letters, and then you can, um, this is less important for, for more senior faculty, but um, early on any manuscripts that you've submitted and any manuscripts that are in preparation and then abstracts. So if you submit an abstract to the ACP and then you present that abstract, you can put that under presentations, but you can also list that abstract under published abstracts because they usually publish the abstracts that are being presented. Um, so that's the order of the bibliography. And again, it goes um, uh, it goes oldest to newest. So you just add on to the list as you get something um, published. Now I'll show you an example in a minute. Um, things to think about um, and the ClinEd uh, residents um, hear a lot about this, about teaching portfolios and things to count uh, as part of education scholarship. But, um, you know, textbook or syllabus chapters, syllabi chapters, teaching modules, um, presentations, any community-based education that you do, web-based materials, curriculum development, updating a curriculum, all of these things count uh, on a teaching um, a, a teaching portfolio and a teaching uh, CV. Um, and again, this just makes the exact same point that education scholarship is not just limited to research and publications. Um, and uh, if the work is made public, if it's available for peer review or critique and it can be reproduced or built upon by other people, then it counts as scholarship. Um, and so uh, all those things are you can put on your CV. 
in building that bibliography, sometimes I see just a list of, um, uh, of publications um, and you can't really see where one ends and the other doesn't. Um, so, you know, think about bolding or underlining your name in each citation. Begin a new numbering sequence for each subsection. So under publications and referee journals, one, two, three, four. And then under book chapters, one, two, three, four. And I realize I'm calling out things you're all getting. I don't have any of that stuff, but what, if you do, um, uh, that's kind of how you do it. And again, numbered chronologically, oldest to newest, and um, and a different uh, restart the num numbering in each subsection. Uh, talked about this um, formatting white space. Um, absolutely um, don't try to cram everything. If it rolls over into a couple more pages, totally fine. Um, you know, a lot of people who are reading these are people like me who have to wear reading glasses. Uh, <laughs> and so don't use small font just and cram things together just to fit them onto one page or two pages or, um, you know, use big readable font, yeah, use right, white yeah. space, white space between sections and lines to just visually call out different things. Um, it really makes it easier for the people reading and it more easily highlights um, the things you've been doing. And here is an example um, of a resident CV, Emily Greenberger um, finished the program in 2016. She's, this was the CV she used for, um, for her first job search. She is now um, uh, at the University of Vermont uh, as a hospitalist. And I heard she just got a job as one of their associate program directors yeah, um, at the University of Vermont. Um, and um, so this is kind of, this is that, um, you know, and it's, there's a, a fair bit of white space between sections and bolding of, of titles. Um, so uh, identification here, um, name, current position. She used her work address instead of her home address, but gave an email address and a cell phone, personal data, she used, she gave date of birth. I've been told now not to do that. Um, you just can do birthplace. Um, and again, you don't person, you know, now with identity theft, um, you, you wanna give away, uh, and, and plus there's no reason for people to know when your birthday is and, and exactly how old you are. That's uh, not necessary anymore. So, but Emily did that um, back then. Um, her education, um, when she got the uh, the degrees, um, postgraduate training, when you know UW Internal Medicine Residency, uh, these were some of the things she had done. She was on MRAC. She was on Dartmouth's uh, School Admissions Committee. Um, she was a writing tutor back at Williams College. Then uh, um, you know honors and awards current licenses to practice, professional memberships. And then committees are also noticed that some of these are listed twice, um, but um, committees uh, down here, research activities, things that she's done, just the one liner, you know, you don't need to put a whole little mini paragraph of the work you did. Um, but sometimes under research activities, this bullet with a one liner, uh, is uh, just gives people um, a chance to see what you worked on. Here's her bibliography. She called it peer reviewed publications. The new language is what I showed before. Again, enumerated and then starting over again with submitted uh, manuscripts. Um, and I would also suggest, Emily didn't do it, but there's her name there. Uh, Cause when I'm reading the CV, I, I wanna see you know, where she is in the author list. So either bold the name or underline your personal name in there. Um, and that's, it's a two pager. Um, and that's really what most of your CVs to some degree are gonna look like. Okay. Um, 
I agree, Kevin, way easier um, where the, the resume, oh my gosh, you know, trying to think about all that formatting. Um, but whoops, but that's, um, that's all you really need. And then uh, Terrence, how in depth do you describe Yes, one line, nothing more than one line. Uh, again, this is, these are just the highlights. Um, you get an interview, people will ask you questions. Um, so, yes, I think, Megan, I think prior careers, um, especially if they were sort of, you know, not, not the summer job at REI, but yes, absolutely. Many of you have done things um, in between. And I think that is absolutely uh, good to, um, good to put in there. So what else is in here? Wow. Oh, Jed, there you go. There's the recent example. <laughs> um, change their names. For people who have changed their name other than bolding, any other recommendations to make it clear you are the author? Um, that's a really good question, Lauren. Um, I see two things. I, you can just bold or underline your name, and um, it may not be your current last name, but um, but if it's bolded or underlined, it'll be pretty clear. The other thing that people sometimes do is put an asterisk um, by it, and then um, if you've changed your name, you you may want to somehow identify that uh, up in the personal information. And all of you do it differently, you know. Um, um, some of you will use a previous last name as and list it as a middle name um, or in the middle, even if it's not officially a middle name. Some people will put underneath their name, underneath Emily E. Greenberger. You could put open parentheses, um, you know, Emily E. Smith close parentheses or formally or nay or um or you don't even have to again times change and you don't even you can just use the single name up here and then i think lauren just again I, i'm being redundant but just underline those names um people will know what you mean nowadays um i i personally don't at least when i read a lot of cvs um I, I get it. It's yeah. We've had residents in the past get married and blend their names. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, with the two last names. And, um, so <laughs> there you go. Uh, maybe just the letter P. <laughs> okay. Uh, I think I bended my name. That's how I ended up as a Lauren Platt jet. It, say, say that again, Lauren, that uh, you did. I blended my name. That's how I oh. ended up as Lauren oh. Platt jet. Yeah. I never knew that. I never knew that. Uh, yeah. No, but this is something I actually think a lot about. I think it's an example of how maybe there's some, some bias in the, the research world towards men because a lot of women have changed their name throughout their research career and a lot of men have it. Um, and so if you search my name in PubMed, half of my publications won't show up and it's, yeah, I hope, I hope we come up with better ways to work on that in the future. Yeah, I hope so too, but I think I totally get it. Um, and I think most people, yeah, doing PubMed searches is an issue, but I think, um, um, Less less yeah. problematic on a CV. I agree. Yes, less, you less can bold your yes. name because you yeah. can bold your name. Yeah. Except then you have to like kind of come out and people are like, so how did you go from Platt to Jet? And then you're like, hmm, well, I know. <laughs> people shouldn't ask. <laughs> they should just. Uh, oh, they do. Everyone does. It's the number oh, one interview question I got on the residency trail. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. That's fine. It was. I thought it was funny. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
And, and yes, I saw comments in the chat. We can send this out. I even have a few other, I'll, I'll send Andrea some PDFs. I have a few other CVs. They're, they're all fairly similar, but um, uh, to this one and, um, uh, and we'll send those around for you. And, and, and one idea, by the way, is to take these with you. I think that's, yeah, it is to take these with you um, to your APD meetings and say, hey, APD, I'm, you know, starting to work on revising or updating or creating my CV. And, you know, we are happy to work on drafts with you and, and, uh, and give feedback about CVs. So, because um, we want you to be all ready to go, you know, by next summer. So, all right. Fantastic. Oh, at one other thing just popped into my brain as I was reading the, the chat box, uh, the, some of the questions. Um, in, yes, just a one liner, but be careful about using abbreviations in your CV. Like if you're, I keep talking about MRAC or RDC, um, but you know, spell it out, um, medicine residency advisory council or committee and, uh, uh, and then, um, because people won't know what things stand for outside of our institution. Okay. Deep breath. We're gonna totally change gears. Totally, totally change gears. And for this next section, um, and I know it's 12, so if your stomach's grumbling and you wanna grab something to eat while we do this, it's totally fine. Um, I. I think it would be if you're able to turn your cameras on for this next section, because it'll be kind of a group discussion. Um, and uh, and there's no, I have it set for 45 minutes, but if it takes 20, it takes 20. Um, and if we take the whole 45, that's fine too. Um, and again, if, um, uh, it it's all, it's all good, but what what I want to I, I am um, what I want to talk about, um, you guys, and I'm going to put this up for a little bit, and then I'll take it down so that we um, see each other. Uh, let me just open, but. I want to talk about the, what's going on and um, and how residency probably hasn't panned out as expected, um, given everything going on. And I think coming out of medical school, you know, you have this idea about what residency was supposed to look like, and you guys started residency last year in the middle of the pandemic. And we had this really isolating year last year and we celebrated the end of that at the resident as leader and teacher course and all got together and had a fabulous day, at least I did. Um, and, um, and I just felt this energy in your class of, you know, finally really getting to know each other and um, hang out together and appreciate each other, you know, outside of the, the work setting. Um, and then it all got shut down again um, with the, the Delta variant. Um, you know, and then the numbers are coming back down again. Um, quite honestly, and that's encouraging. But, you know, the R2 year really suddenly pivoted, we had to pivot again. And um, and so 
even this year now is not looking like what it even we even thought it was going to look like in July. So I'm curious to hear from you guys uh, and to just give you space to share, you know, what were your expectations? What does residency look like now for you? What was lost for you? What are you grieving? What are the gaps um, in, in the difference between what it is and what it could be? And then I'm really interested in hearing how we can turn the gaps into goals. Like what can residency look like? We don't know. I mean, Frig, we don't know how long this is going to go on or if there'll be the Epsilon variant coming next. And um, <laughs> or some of you may know what some of the other variants are. And so I know that me personally, I have been grieving the loss of my interactions with you, seeing you on a daily basis, wandering the wards, making rounds with you at being at conferences. Um, and and it's a loss for me. Um, and um, but I'm curious what how you're feeling about all this. Again, what was residency supposed to look like for you? What was this, or even just the R2 year? Because you kind of knew what the R1 year was going to be. What does residency look like now? What's lost? What are the gaps? What are you grieving? And then how can we turn those? things that we're grieving, the losses, how do we turn those into goals and, and change residency and make it, you know, something that we can, uh, you know, we, we have a new vision for what residency and what being in a, in a community of residents, I guess that's almost more what I'm talking about is, is our community um, and what can it look like? What, what are things we can do? Does that all make sense to you? Yeah, I guess just to start and throw out something, I think, you know, overall residency has been challenging, but to agree that I think most of us kind of expected, but I think just like you said, the, the element of community is something that I think a lot of us chose this program for of how that you could really like feel how strong that was. Um, and I still think, you know, we've done a very good job of trying to maintain that. And I think, you know, we, I do feel a really strong sense of community, but I think so much, so many of us love that and could always use more. And obviously so much of that has been affected by COVID. And I think um, for myself, I like feel re-energized anytime I can get together with people, even if it's like, just for a short period of time. And I think, um, you know, I can't speak to what conferences were like before, but I feel like our inability to get to educational conferences sometimes because of COVID restrictions and then just like the, the small little interactions of, you know, like, hey, let's uh, grab a like coffee after work or um, do things like that are, again, very much because of COVID, we've kind of gotten into a lot of normalized routines of whether like it's a lot harder to do a lot of those small little things and I don't know if that's like a program-wide thing that can be changed because it's obviously highly influenced by COVID but I think um, just anything that's incorporating and promoting more like community camaraderie is always going to be something that's good. Thanks Luke. I think the hardest thing for this, for me with this, this rise in Delta is kind of the implicit understanding that residency is just going to be like this. And there's really no metaphorical light at the end of the tunnel. Like these variants are going to keep coming. Patients are going to keep getting sick. People are not going to get vaccinated. And, um, that this is kind of a new reality that we have to deal with and manage our own risk and our patient's risk. And it's just a lot to kind of put together in your head when you're trying to train as well. 
Yeah. Yeah, managing. Yeah. No. Go ahead, Lauren. Sorry if my um, video is not working well. That's right okay. Now. No, it's fine. My audio, hopefully my audio is, but I think Dr. Doan and I were actually talking about this uh, about a week ago. And one thing that's hard, I think, is, you know, we're young, we're vaccinated now. And I think if we're in a different profession, we might be able to hang out with people in groups and be a little bit more um, like open to that. But when you're also like, you know, on the HEMONC wards, you're taking on this responsibility of protecting your immune compromised patients. And that I think emotional and, and real responsibility of trying not to get infected so you don't spread the virus to them is mm -hmm. a real thing that we're dealing with that our non-medical peers aren't. Um, and just adds like a complication. It just makes being social complicated. Um, for us in a way that I think it's not as much for other people. That's been tough. Yeah. I also think um, I found it kind of interesting, you know, chatting with my, you know, like my ramp buddy and then all of my other friends who are interns kind of like reliving some of their, like the stress combined with the isolation when they talk about what it's like to go through their first couple of wards months or their Mick to like come out and be like so angry after their Mickey month. Um, and then not be able to like be with their, with their co-interns. It's, I just feel like trying to build, like see them similarly struggle to build their community, um, in the typical ways that they would have thought before is just really hard. Yeah. I think we're all incredibly grateful for the effort that you guys put in to make the R2 event happen, by the way, because if we didn't have that, there wouldn't be much to reflect on in terms of a community building environment. But that was that went so far for me personally. Thanks. Thanks, Jed. Yeah, for, for us too, actually. But uh yeah, we really pushed hard to slip that in, you know, kind of a thing. Uh. Yeah, I think it's pretty evident that we're all like not really talking about residency. We're talking about like community right. within residency, which I think A speaks to how well residency is generally going, but um, also just speaks to the need of trying to figure out ways to maintain this community. And some people probably disagree with this, but I, I do wonder about like how much Zoom we're doing and really trying to get back to in-person things, even for like short meetings. I guess it's potentially a pain to go bike to Harborview for a one hour meeting, but sometimes just that like, for like academic half day or something like that, the personal connection that you get um, oh. goes beyond the the talk. Yeah, have we thought about like doing, I mean, as a raffle or something like that, like having a hybrid um, where we can try to get good like um, audio and video for someone presenting in person with maybe a group of like seven to 10 people in a large room. And then everybody, like there's another set of people who are, um, who are there on Zoom. Um, no, I haven't thought about that at all. This is, uh, this is where we get to take some power and make, re make our residency community, you know, change what it looks like. <laughs> That's what I meant by that last question. So let, let me, help me understand, like, you mean, and that's on a rotating basis? Yeah, so I, think, there's a I think maybe just like if we, um, you can be a it, random assignment, you know, if you're on like an outpatient block, maybe you do some in person and then other people who are, I don't know, I think if you're like doing your, well, I guess we don't have academic half days when we're on like an inpatient block, but um, I'm sure Whitney would have some insight into figuring out how to randomly select a certain group of people and rotate them through on whatever blocks. So for academic half days, we could have a hybrid of in-Zoom groups um, and then 
uh, other people who are maybe needing a bit more rest. Because I, I will say, I mean, that's like, that is one of the big benefits, I think, of like the Zoom academic half day is that I can like wake up five minutes before and turn on my, my camera. So I kind of get like an extra hour. But I agree with Luke that um, there have been many times where like during our clinic block right now, I've been like, oh God, why do I have to go to things in person? But then I get there and I'm realizing actually how, how much I missed it. And I've just like caught and gotten the routine of being on Zoom. Yeah. I think yeah, had other... of... Oh, sorry, Ken. Go ahead, Megan, please. I think we've sort of had a like somewhat pilot of that because the the VA thing this year. And I will say, I think when it's interactive, I've really, I don't know how many people have had to do the VA thing. Oh yeah, Terrence is writing about it too. It's really nice when it's interactive and we had one where we had like a really great discussion and we like went and sat outside and it was really nice to be in person. But when we were just there sitting on computers and I can imagine maybe just there like watching a lecture without a lot of interaction, it was actually more frustrating to have to like get up and drive to the VA and do the whole thing. So maybe it's sort of when they're interactive or when we're doing discussion-based ones, we could maybe do groups at diff the different hospitals and when it's going to be more of lecture based, that's when we could give everyone a chance to just do it from home. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I like that. This might be over complicated things, but um, sorry, I'll, I'll try to go quick. But, you know, I feel like we have so many different locations around here, like the main hospitals, all the different outpatient clinics. Like if there's a way to coordinate like a room in each of those where we, we have something going on so that we didn't we don't have to necessarily like take the bus for 45 minutes to get somewhere and then go right back afterwards. And we can just like walk half a mile and then like participate with other people who are geographically nearby and then just go home afterwards or have the Zoom option also. I think that, I mean, we've tried to bring morning reports more in person mm -hmm. these days, which really like seems like a an easier target to hit from a like epidemiology perspective and a logistical perspective. And I think continuing that focus has been really good. It's sometimes hard to make it to report no matter what, but I don't know. I think academic half day on the couch is one thing, but if morning report is zoom based, I think you, your, your interaction with your colleagues goes down a lot more based on how much admitting we do. And yeah. I think there's also a critical mass if we get to that momentum of having morning report be expected again. And I think with the Zoom, it tends to be on like take the wayside. And so there have definitely been, I think there's been a movement in the last couple of months of morning report being more, you know, more people show up at that begets more attendees but um just making that emphasis to be in person is really important yeah i will also echo that at harbor view we've been doing it at uh morning report in person and at least personally i find it way more enjoyable and interactive to do it that way as both you know a senior presenting or just um coming to like listen in and learn from the cases versus you know i contrast that with uh, noon conference, which is generally Zoom based. Um, and you're listening to it usually through like crappy speakers on the on the thing. And I, and I, I think that's like one of like multiple issues. Um, I don't think just just fixing that. I think it's nice to be in an environment that is like isolated off where you can just talk to people and have that personal connection. Um, yeah, I think I think this also kind of gets it like a semi kind of bigger thing that I think has been a discussion, not just within like my experience as a medical student on from the outside looking into the program and now being in and then talking with more senior um, folks within the program is that I think we had like this impetus to, to push everybody to get into in-person stuff, but I still feel like um, all like throughout a lot of last year, the system wasn't really set up to enable me to go to to morning report. So if we do make a decision that I think we should like focus on our educational activities more and that those should be um, in person, then we need to kind of structurally figure out how to talk with, because um, it's not just intern report or senior report where somebody will hold the page or like, we need to figure out a better way to, I think, force our um, 
I guess like, I don't know, have like a forcing function to have people go to, to them and maybe have attendings cover the pager or something like that. Cause it happens very inconsistently. And um, I can see like after a few months of us doing this, once we start getting back into the swing of feeling stressed out with like our work while we're at morning report, people stop coming, which is I think kind of what was going on before. Yeah, there's definitely like there is zero, like Priyanka said, there's zero protection for education when you're in the team room. You're like, I, right. I've kind of, st I've stopped tuning in for noon conference um, because I just think I find it more distracting. Yeah, Mac, I, I definitely second that. Like when I was an intern and like when I was learning the system in the first few months, um, unless somebody pushed me to go to morning reports, um, I always had something to do. Um, and I felt like I was missing out on the educational stuff. So I, I think, you know, especially where, like for interns, they need someone to push them to go to morning report and kind of help with their pager and stuff so that they don't miss uh, the very, very interesting educational stuff at morning report. Yeah, I had noon conference on the computer in the team room um, recently and someone came in and asked me to turn it off uh, or at least like mute the sound um, so that they could have a discussion about something else. And it was fine because I'll be for the other reasons that I just mentioned, you know, I wasn't able to give it my full attention anyways. Um, but I think it's like an overarching, like there's like no protected educational space and, and thinking about, you know, my experience as a medical student and we want to talk about like how I thought residency was going to be. I do feel, and a lot of it's because of COVID and I recognize that. Um, I do miss some of the educational feel of uh, that. I feel like we've maybe gone to a lot more service and less education. And, and some of that stems from how hard we work and it's just tired and trying to get out of the hospital and trying to, as a group, create some protected space to get back to that. Because when we do um, get to go to morning report in person, like I absolutely love it. I just want to say one of the reasons why I chose internal medicine was I remember at the VA at my med school, um, there was protected time to go to morning report. Everybody went to morning report. Attendings, residents, like all the attendings on the service, all the residents on the service, all the interns, all the med students. We all went into like this room with a um, screen. Somebody was doing presenting the case and we all had small group breakout discussions. You know, sure, sure people will come in and out to like deal with pages. But for the most part, um, I thought that that culture um, you know, and, and just the uh, discussions that we had is, is really one of my fondest memories of uh, my medicine rotation at the VA, my med school. And, um, you know, I think the you know, probably logistically with some call issues here, like, you know, maybe that's why we don't do it. But, um, you know, that was something I was looking forward to coming to residency. And, and it's, I feel like just culturally, we, we haven't really had that here. Yeah, I want to highlight something that Megan said in the chat too. And my med school did this, where like she said at like noon conference, everyone went and the chiefs held and triaged the pagers. My med school, like everyone, even like on like inpatient services, went to academic half day on Thursday mornings or Thursday afternoons or something. And like there were the like the per, one of the associate program directors was always there, like holding all the pagers, and everyone had to hand in their pager like while they went into academic half day and like. Or like, you know, same thing with noon conference and you could like hold on to it if there was something important for noon conference, but like there was that really like culture of protection and not just dependent on whether you're attending decides to offer it or not. I love that idea. <laughs> Anytime I can sign out my page or to somebody is, a, is something I can get behind. Um, I guess it's not really constructive, but I think it's just worth saying, like, when you have a busy day, anytime you can kill two birds with one stone is great. And so I like grieve the loss of lunch talks when you could go and you have to eat and you could eat a meal and um, listen to a talk at the same time was awesome. And I don't know how you fix that given COVID. And I think that maybe is one of the constraints that we're dealing with. I'll kind of like kind of piggyback onto what Thomas was saying because I, I I think that like 
I really try not to eat my lunch and do work at the same time. Like I'll purposely walk away and go to like the cafeteria and I'll sit for like 20 minutes. Cause like, unless I'm like on the Mickey, even when I would be on the Mickey, I had like time to go sit. And I don't think like, I think we should maybe try to start calling these things out about our culture of like get lunch and try to finish up some of the things we'll do this here in a little bit. Um, I think we just have a, um, we have so many opportunities in the day to, I think, improve the amount that we're socializing with each other or seeing each other and being with each other. And we just need to kind of enable those right now. Sorry, I said that, this- That definitely was, um, go ahead. I said this in the chat, but I also feel like going to report as a senior directly interferes with my ability to sign out by 530. And it is really hard to make choices that are like, wow, this would be good for my education or seeing other residents, but I have to make like active choices that that means that I can't get home by 630. Um, and that's really hard. Or like the pressure to discharge people early means that I'm like racing to get done with rounds and trying to get the discharge stuff in. And then morning report like directly interferes with that. And like, I know that's not stuff that the residency program can control, but as I've transitioned into this senior role, I felt a lot more frustration about like that. It feels like the hospital system itself and my responsibilities are the reason that I, my educational opportunities like aren't as robust. Yeah, and when the post or wait, the call senior is giving morning report, the only other senior there is the senior alone. And it's really nice if you have like the support from your co-resident, but when it's that one person who has to decide whether to come and possibly, you know, push their sign out to 6:30 or even later, it's that's a lot of pressure as well. I literally like this thought of organizing some sort of expectation maybe the attendings hold the pagers or or whatever during conferences because i think we all want to be going to conferences and a lot of it is not covid it's like the sheer magnitude of work that we have to do and um so organ at least just thinking more about how we can get people to conferences will build that sense of community both intellectually and just vibe wise I'd be curious, I know that there was a movement at the VA last month to push morning report earlier from like a 1030 to a 10 start time, because it kind of has this awkward thing of you have morning report for an hour and then you have a half hour or maybe an hour at most of turnaround time before you're expected at for lunch conferences, which I think is a detriment to kind of both since it's kind of an awkward time of the day. I don't know if it ended up working well or not, but that was a discussion. It, that's what's currently happening now. I don't, the last morning report I was at the VA, it started at 10. I can see that working well at Harborview too, where we oftentimes have like social work rounds at like 9.30. And you could go like straight from social work rounds and then just transition into morning report. Um, and then the other thing I wonder is trying to um, have that balance of education, but also like having a reasonable work-life balance is, you know, thinking about like, would it be reasonable or a good idea to like try and consolidate the talks and be just go instead of having morning report and noon conference to just going towards noon conference? And I already see that look of uh, probably not um, of, of trying to do like a talk plus a case, but um, I don't know. The, the look you saw was that we're grieving the loss of education time and now we would structurally create less education time. Um, and, and so, but I hear what you're saying. If it's balanced, I, I, I do. Yeah, that idea has come up in the past, but I want to not say too much. Yeah. I've also, I've seen it. I've seen it done where it, it is just like a little pre-conference before noon conference. So those are sort of grouped together, which I suppose is like a longer period of time away from patient care, but also sort of gets you to both and has like the added motivation of food and so forth. I don't know, just a, another idea. I think my institution in med school, they moved it way morning report way forward to 9 a.m. 
um, so that you had the chance to round on the absolutely most urgent patients, but you didn't bleed in like, and then you would have a longer time in the late morning in order to round on all of the olds and of the kind of less acute patients. Have we ever um, done an actual like kind of data gathering thing for our residents where we say during, you know, these three months, tell us how many conferences you're going to, to really quantify how few educational opportunities that we're able to make it to? Uh, I, I think the answer to that would be no in that sort of a formalized way. And, and I, I, I do wanna validate so much of what people were just saying about, um, because you're noticing differences between here and your medical school or between here, between what's going on now and when you came to interview. I, I heard comments about that and saw them in the chat. But I wanna, and, and there are always challenges in any residency program about the workload issues and the trade-offs, but those conferences used to be like that here. Um, and so what we're, what you're grieving is by not, because you have, because you came in as an R1 and it was already got changed. That's what our morning reports were like. They were at 10 AM and there was coffee and there was breakfast and there was, um, and a lot of people came and, and not everyone could always come. Some of those same challenges occurred. Um, and then, um, and then there was noon conference with lunch and learning and you'd get paged and sometimes you'd stay for the whole conference. Sometimes you wouldn't, you know, and, um, and, uh, all those. So we really have lost that here coupled with the increased workload that's occurred during COVID, um, it's added a lot of stress. So uh, you guys really have identified things that, um, yeah, uh, that have changed during the time of COVID, so. Yeah, I have to echo that, like being a medical student here and then going away for intern year and then coming back, like I feel like um, prior to COVID, like we actually had that sense, you know, of community and like getting together. And a lot of people showed up for morning report and then um, uh, for like noon conference and stuff. And then, you know, just unfortunately because of COVID we're in the, in the situation that we are in, in terms of limitations and stuff. And then I feel like um, at my previous program, what we did is actually we had, um, we didn't have like noon conference. We had teaching at like 2 p.m. And honestly, I feel like no one really enjoyed that. No one enjoyed having teacher later, teaching later in the day because honestly, I feel like at the end of the day, everyone is exhausted. Every, everyone just wants to like finish up their work, sign out, and then just go home. So I actually appreciate having conferences, um, you know, in the middle of the day, although sometimes it does take us away from morning rounds, but I feel like at 10 o'clock or at nine o'clock, it's a lot more conducive to our learning. Um, I think it was Jordan in the chat really succinctly put it how the call schedule um, makes it difficult to attend a morning report like most days because your post call you go home you miss it and then I think it was like your senior alone and you're just spread too thin to be able to like comfortably go and spend an hour learning and then um, your only day when you get good uh like bandwidth to attend morning report is your call day when when you have to be there to present um so i think i you know as you pointed out like a bigger structural conversation about the pros and cons of our call shift but i think that does make it challenging for sure and not ideal when you're going to like one out of four conferences yeah totally All right yeah um yeah. This was also brought up in the chat, but I think the idea of putting um, teaching rounds or like conferences before rounding, I think potentially would really work. And then we could just get some coffee there. <laughs> um, because I think a huge problem for me is like when it's 1030 or whatever, I have things I can be doing at that time. And you really have to choose between getting your things done or 
going to teaching and we just happen to choose getting things done um, because we're so busy. And I think forcing us to just go early before we even kind of create things for ourselves to do that day might be one way to increase attendance. Um, Like we could pre-round, you throw in your orders that need to happen for that day and then everyone goes to conference. I like that idea. Yeah, I think there have been a lot of people in the chat saying that that's how it was at their medical school, which I can say was also the way it was at my medical school, that like you pre-rounded and then like everybody went to morning report, like between pre-rounding and rounding and you left from morning report and like went on your way on rounds, which I think like, and then, I mean, at my medical school, it was also like, if you weren't done with rounds by noon conference, like it didn't matter. You paused rounds and you went to noon conference. Like that was just the culture there. And like the attending knew and the senior resident knew and it was like you really tried to finish but if you weren't done with rounds yet it like you were going anyways and you would start them back up afterwards which i think like made the rounding order really important and put sort of like an increased pressure on the senior residents like pick a good rounding order but you know we have to do that anyways this just got brought up in the chat as well but i think attending presence at uh conferences is really really slim a lot of the time and whenever someone is there like bob harrington was at my dinky little morning report the other day and it was awesome um and i think if that was more of an expectation of the faculty we could really you know get some pithy quotes and other things to learn yeah. <laughs> and that is a loss too by the way that is a change and a loss during the time of covid um by the way jed just so you know Bob Harrington um, shouted you out the other day too after that morning report. <laughs> he loved it too. <laughs> I think I agree with that general sentiment of like trying to have, because um, uh, I guess in morning report, everybody's a learner. We need to have, I think, learners at more, I think, advanced stages coming in because then I think the clinical reasoning really benefits there. I think a lot of the time morning report is filled with our six or seven medical students. And then you have your senior resident presenting and as we've already talked about, maybe or maybe not, there's another senior. Um, and if there's like maybe an attending, um, but it's, I, I don't know, I just, over this last year, I, uh, you can really tell the difference between like the clinical reasoning and like the type of the type of thought process that comes out when there's that wide range of, of people at um, that morning report. Yeah, really great discussion. So far, I've heard um, we I've heard some solutions, but I've heard that we're grieving the loss of community. We expected residency to be a little bit more community based. Some people said even especially this program, and so we're grieving the loss of community and time together. We're grieving the loss of education time um, and uh, the loss of, you know, sort of the eat and learn lunch talks. Um, and, um, and then we're, we're grieving the loss of senior learners at our, at our uh, teaching events, you know, now that, and I think that's because they're more virtual. I mean, a lunch conference at Harborview, the, Auditor, the conference room was full with both faculty fellows and students and residents. And, um, and now since it's online, it's really just the residents uh, sort of. Uh, so we're grieving the loss of senior learners and the, the teaching that comes from that. Um, and um, yeah, uh, other other thing, and then of course, you guys have suggested lots of different, you know, things that we might be able to shape and change. You know, um, other things. 
along a similar line of like teaching conferences and getting more senior staff involved, I've seen other programs do like debates between attendings on particular topics or like clinical unknowns with attendings running through them, of like really trying to challenge and attending and seeing how they go through their thought process. Is that something that we've ever thought about doing or have done? Uh, uh, yeah, I haven't seen us do the pro-con debate uh, thing very much locally over the years, maybe a few times, but not much. But um, but we absolutely used to do, you know, throw the attending in front of the room and, and pitch a case and watch their clinical reasoning. Um, but those, um, I haven't seen us do that in certainly the year and a half, but we... Um, and I'm not sure why. I don't know whether it's more energy, whether it doesn't work as well. But th these are great. Those are great, Luke. I mean, certainly a pro-con debate over a certain thing strikes me that that might jazz up, you know, the online learning a little bit instead of just a lecture. Um, so. I don't know that this observation is going to have a great action item, but I will say, I think the other thing is like, um, you know, my wonderful co-residents who I get to hang out with periodically, I feel like I love so much. Um, getting to hang out with you in the NICU, Ken, when you were my attending was like so wonderful. It was like, oh, I like get to know Ken, who I've seen like three times previously in person in my entire life is like wild, right? And I wonder if there's more opportunity for like us as residents to like hang out with you or like other like program leadership or like, you know, Kelly and Andrea, like all these people who we like frequently email, but like never see in person or like the actual program itself. Your, tissue, to... is, your tissue is behind you next to your plant, Ken. Yeah, it is actually. Yeah, you guys, that, we're grieving. I started to say this at the beginning, but when we grieve, one of the things I, on Tuesdays, I used to round with you guys on your various teams. Kelly knows this. My Tuesday mornings were blocked. Actually, Wednesdays for the VA because it works better. And I used to, um, and so I'd rotate around the sites and I would round with the post-call team and every Tuesday, and I would get to see you guys in action. You would see me and I'd go to morning report. And with COVID that got shut down because they didn't need one more vector on rounds. And, and now look a year and a half later and look what, look at the impact of that, you know, on me and, and Celia, you know, on you guys maybe. Um, but, um, uh, there's just been so much, you know, I keep using the word loss, but there's been so much change because of COVID. Um, and, um, that some of these, and we didn't do everything perfectly, believe me. And there were always those tensions of work versus time for conference, but you know, the, so much of the ideal that you guys have talked about um, used to exist here not very long ago. Can we PDSA it? Oh, cool. Oh, I see. Yeah. Ken, can I ask a question? Yeah. So I guess, and this is kind of relating back to the sentiment that I was expressing earlier, where we're kind of in this at this point for an undetermined yeah. amount of time. Yeah. And yeah. I wonder how much of these policies. Yeah, that were put in place by the Department of Medicine and things that were kind of out of your control, like were done so in the spirit that we got to get through this period yeah. and then we'll get yeah. back to normal versus kind of adapting to what appears to be a new normal. And like how these things that you're and we are grieving, like we can just you know, how, how are the powers that be feeling about that now that we're kind of in this new normal-ish space? I, that's, that's a really good question. And I think everything was put into place at the beginning 
like we need to do this short term to get through this period of crisis. And um, and and quite honestly, there was actually probably more, you know, <laughs> uh, more at the. I, I'm not sure at the senior level uh, of the institutions or the departments that there was any thought at all to like, okay, but if this becomes a new normal, how do we adapt to it? It was more, and that's why I'm loving this conversation. And it's part of why I put it out there to you guys is I don't think any of it, even if COVID persists, what I hear is that the, the status quo, every, I, I don't wanna, I, my thoughts are not fully formed yet. So, um, but what has currently been put into place to get us through now is not becoming sustainable and we have to adapt. We have to figure out a way like some of your ideas to, in case this is, if we are in it for the long haul, how do we reshape and take control of and make residency look more like what we want it to look like and yet still be COVID safe. We have to still be COVID safe, right? Um, and, and as someone said earlier, man, you have to manage your risk, not just for yourself, but for the patients that you're then gonna go take care of. Um, and so there's this added layer of that. Um, but this is, I, I wanna start talking about how do we gain control and, and what can residency look like in the, in if COVID persists for NP, as people are saying, um, you know, it probably will to some degree off and on, at a, you know, uh, for some time. And so, yeah, I'm rambling now, sorry. I'll be quiet, but I think, oh no, one last thing. I know I was gonna say this. Um, I know in my personal conversations with Barbara Young, she's one of the few people in leadership that I hear talking about trying to reshape the normal. Um, and, um, but again, there's the, the institution is, uh, so many of these policies are all institutional that we're all trying to follow. I. I also just, I mean, I feel like we have really evidence-based and effective ways to prevent the spread of things going on. And we have a lot of other things going on where people like don't wear masks, they're eating in the cafeteria, they're doing all of these things. And then we can't have like a gathering in a large room of everybody masked and things like really strict. And I feel like when I've asked some people about like, like either like, you know, ID folks or people in infection control, like I like, I just get like a hard no. And I like I and I just wonder if there's going to be like I mean it's I think it'll be difficult but I think we just need to start advocating for like what you're saying is investing in the things that'll like keep us more sustainable as a community. I haven't had an opportunity to go to the um, like medicine reflection groups. I, I I think there's one next week. I think. Um, and those are the ones at people's houses. And I'm wondering how that works with infection because that seems like a good opportunity, but they come kind of so infrequently um, that I don't immediately have the bandwidth or the time forethought to like go. Um, right. And I was wondering if there was an opportunity to do something of a similar type, but on a smaller scale, maybe like specifically within a class. Yes. Um, and I, I recognize that there is some momentum that needs to be happening like on our part to generate that. But I think one of the things that is particularly helpful is having a certain amount of institutional support to say, okay, like every Thursday and having people, you know, having a little bit more institutional, yeah, support to grease the wheels of that structured socialization. Yeah. Yeah, and that's what I, Erica, that's along the same theme of what I heard earlier about creating this um, <laughs> uh, this rotating kind of schedule. I mean, the logistics are like, but, the, you know, of where 
you know, some people get to go in person to a conference, other people's watch, other people watch virtually, and then it rotates. So there's at least this, the, the small group stuff is still allowed. Um, and small educational groups are still allowed. Um, and, um, uh, you know, so that, you know, finding meaning in medicine is, is at someone's home. It's a small group. It's a private gathering. Um, and people wear masks. Actually, I, you know, I've been and people, you know, are, are wearing their masks if, we're, if they're indoors. And when the weather was nice, we were able to do them outside. Um, and um, so th those are, these are ways we may be, need to adapt uh, to, uh, you know, but I, but yeah, large group function, official large group functions, um, you know, the department, the school, uh, you know, is still saying no to because safety is important. I, I mean, I don't want to demand. I I don't want to sound like I'm scoffing at the at the risks or at, at safety. Though it's important for us to be doing that, but um, being creative to create other opportunities. I think kind of like I like what Michael is saying too about figuring out things maybe in place of academic half day, even if like we had like, cause it sounds like the model at the VA right now doesn't really work where there are some people kind of like, who are there participating, like listening to a lecture in a group quietly, not interacting. Have we, is it too much to like ask residents to, I know, I mean, academic half day talks can take a long time. So this is probably too big of an ask to like have more, more like a bigger pool of talks. And then you can have like, groups that are in person and we just have like separate academic half days from each other. I know the point is to like standardize it, but um, yeah, I, I also don't know what the definition is. I mean, like we say small and then like the, the morning report room at Harborview probably had like 20 something people in it the other day. Yeah, small is not Define, I actually asked recently and it's not defined. <laughs> I remember that, Kevin. The, those were amazing. Okay, well, this has been a fantastic discussion. It's uh, been going on for 50 minutes. Um, any other thoughts or things to grieve or um, uh, as we then try to turn gaps into goals, as, as we said, uh, I've been taking notes. Yeah, it, you're welcome. It's, um, I think you've gotten the point. I want you, I, I, I think you know that I'm grieving loss too, uh, of, uh, you know, of a residency community that I love um, and, uh, and the activities uh, in it that I love. And, um, but, um, but now it's time to start thinking about, you know, uh, not just listening, not just grieving, but adapting a little bit. And, um, and that's what I want to put some energy into. Um, and some of your ideas have been fabulous. And I think uh, I'm going to talk, by the way, I'm going to talk about this with the R1s later this month at their fall professional development day. Um, and um, so, uh, <laughs> uh, I just love, I love the chat. I love you guys. Um, and I want to share, um, whoops, I want to want to share one very last slide in summary because there's, um, we, and some of you, maybe some of you have heard me talk about this before, I'm not sure, um, but, um, there's this 
concept of resilience. And, and I think the definition of resilience needs to change. Um, I think resilience in the past meant two things. It was either being unmoved or unaffected or unchanged by outside force. You're just resi resilient, resistant to, you know, things hit you and they don't affect you. Um, or the, phys the old physics definition of resilience, which is when things are deformed out of their normal shape, resilience is the concept of them springing back to their previous shape as if they weren't somehow changed or impacted or affected by that. Um, and and I, I recently heard um, and saw an, a new um, definition of resilience that really helped answer the concerns that I had with those previous definitions of you know, resilience. And I actually think this is a much better definition that resilience is not being unaffected by things around you. And it's not being able to spring back and being just back to normal. I think resilience for me is the process of adapting well in the face of adversity, in the face of stresses um, that impact us. That these things that go on around us in work, in life, um, they do impact us, they do change us. And to pretend like they don't, and that we're just gonna, oh, in six months, we're just gonna be back to normal again, um, I think is wrong. And um, instead, I think, to be resilient means figuring out how to adapt well in the face of this stress um, and adapt positively and, you know, um, and to recognize that we've been changed by something and to, um, whether it's what we've been talking about or even something in your personal life um, and to recognize that we're, we're changed by these things and we're not going to be back to exactly the way we were before, nor should we. That seems abnormal to me, actually. And so I wanted to share this with you and um, I hope it resonates with you as well. Um, and, and, I, uh, and I think that's where I wanna take this conversation with all this stuff that you talked about and to figure out how we can adapt um, and, uh, and regain some of um, what we wanna get out of this period of time uh, called residency. So, um, no. thank you everybody. Um, I, um, I'll bring this to a close unless anyone else has any final comments and I'll let you get on with your day. There's those clouds I talked about earlier are now gone here. So it's a beautiful afternoon for you to do some personal professional development.